Friends, we are back with Matt Eric. Right now we're having part two of Matt explaining the dark histories of uh, Can- of Canada and how it relates to being a wedge between America and Russia. Because when uh, Matt sort of hinted on that in a discussion we were having recently, that really sparked uh, the uh, sort of... Uh, turned on that little cartoon light bulb in my mind. And we were just talking for the last hour. Matt was sort of laying down the groundwork of a lot of the history of Canada and how this all works. So if you missed that, you might want to actually watch that video first. But anyways, Matt, we've kind of left off somewhere still in sort of like the uh, 1800s, the British Empire sort of losing their grip, uh, their dark secrets being revealed. Uh, Canada becomes independent uh, through an uh, orgiastic constitutional writing process where they were in the Confederacy during the Civil War. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Canada, Canada kind of starts to break away, but uh, providing a blockade from the potential railroad going from America up through British Columbia, which would become American Columbia, to, to Alaska, over to Russia, and creating a quite nice economic situation for the growing America and Russia. That's kind of where we left off here. All right. Yeah. Or did I, or did I miss that's something? That's exactly where we left off. Okay. Yeah, that's so, fine. What, so what's that's next? Yeah. All right. So what's next? And uh, I would just say, yeah, the, the, so Canada becomes a Confederacy that works. The British Confederacy project that works is Canada enshrined yeah. with a, a, a British directed deep state in its actual constitution. Yeah. Um, that has a privy council, a governor general, uh, as a foreign directed complex managing the legal structures of Canada. Um, with some democratic veneer on the surface, but not in its in its core. Yeah. Now the thing was, okay, so British British Columbia has a, a huge movement. Their economy has has just been hammered because they're they were formerly um, flying on the wave of the gold rush. That was yeah. like a big economic boom, but like all booms, it busted. And uh, turned out a lot of the gold that was promised to be there was really just a big mythology. And so there were ghost towns. They went Uh-oh. to a big economic. A collapse yeah. in British Columbia. Their only economic partnership was with San Francisco. Yeah. They had no economic activity with the, with the mother country in Britain or with the um, the other eastern colonies of uh, you know separated by three thousand kilometers of nothing. No development. No rail across yeah, Canada. Yeah. The only rail was the world's first trans- transcontinental rail, which bl- was built up by Lincoln and finished in eighteen sixty nine. So there was a big race over what was going to be the future orientation of humanity vis-a-vis the Arctic, the, the Northern frontier. And uh, so F- Frederick Seymour, like I mentioned, is eliminated. The governor uh, of Britain who's protecting mm-hmm. the annexationists, he's eliminated, probably killed. His tr- his enemies are, are put into the position that he had once occupied, and they all of a sudden facilitate getting, getting British Columbia into the Confederation, which requires a threefold bribe. Number one, get rid of BC's unpayable debts because that was holding them down. Britain mm. wasn't giving them an inch. So they said, you know, mm-hmm. pay us our debts, uh, pay, us, pay us off of our debts. I forget the, the third one, but the middle one, which is the most important, was connect us economically to the East Coast. If you can do that in, yeah. in a reasonable way, we will join the Confederation. The promises were made. It took 15 years to finally build the rail, but it was built as part of the bribe. But part of the thing holding back the, the rail being built was the fact that the Hudson Bay Company that was set up, you know, by uh, I think it was in the 17th century uh, called Rupert's Land was still private British East India Company controlled territory that had mm-hmm. to then be federalized, which they sold for pennies on the dollar in uh, in the 18, 1867 to then now say, OK, now that we have full ownership of this territory in the north. Now we can finally figure out a way to build a rail and uh, and use that rail not for the purpose of driving home econo- uh, driving the economy forward, but rather just to keep British control over this t- strategic real estate between uh, the former Russian territory of Alaska that has now been purchased by the United States, which was supposed to see rail and telegraph lines built up mm-hmm. uh, across and under the Bering Strait, as we had discussed. People yeah. like Alexander III were for it. Sergei Vita was for it. Later on, Nicholas II was for it before he was derailed in his own way. Oh, I like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go yeah, Use that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> that's where the uh, Canada sort of got its, its, its origin moment, its origin story mm. built on a fallacy. But the reality was it was the zone that was used by Confederate British operations to kill Lincoln. As we went through in the last episode, people yeah. should watch that to get a sense quickly of that. 
um, and then to keep it as much as possible a wedge preventing the inevitable eventual or possibly inevitable um, economic integration or cooperation around a U.S. Russian policy of a a type of manifest destiny that would be premised on the idea of the mandate of heaven that we would go to not conquer the weak or enslave, but rather spread the best of civilization in a in a an idea of a, of a of a society of win win cooperation, or as John Quincy Adams had called it under the his idea of the Monroe Doctrine was an idea of a family of nations. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't want to go around the way Teddy Roosevelt misused the Monroe Doctrine as a way to say all of the Americas are ours with the big stick policy, yeah. but rather the Monroe Doctrine idea was. Let's earn the friendship and cooperation of our neighbors in Ibero-America by helping them help themselves, by extending mm-hmm. you know, investment aid into industrial growth the way John Quincy Adams and his, mm-hmm. his prodigy Lincoln and, their, and his prodigies um, had, had aspired to, or that China is currently sort of bringing back to life in a certain natural way again today with Russia. Um, so that sort of sets the stage for uh, Canada as a wedge. Mm-hmm. The uh, but it doesn't it doesn't happen that easily because you still have the a, a sort of culture of love of technological progress that's tied to the idea of the, the the emancipation morally of society of mankind from empire that was still uh, seen as two sides of the same coin that if you're going to have an elimination of empire and of, of societies of slavery you need to have technological growth and new discoveries mm-hmm. today that's been confused and people have, have got all scrambled eggs by that. But uh, <clears throat> people like William Gilpin um, had outlined a program for the international, what's called the International Land Bridge, uh, 1890. This this guy who's the former um, first governor of Colorado Territory, the the personal bodyguard of Lincoln, who does who who saves Lincoln by stopping a Western Confederate uh, flank from opening up on the western mm. side in Colorado. He has a militia that he funds with his own personal state state based greenback system in 1862, which huh. prevents the uh, the a Western flank, which saves again the Union. And this guy is known as the father of manifest destiny in the good way. He's always anti Jackson. He's against slavery. He fights with Lincoln. He's the only uh, re- uh, Lincoln Republican in the entire con- uh, Colorado area. But at the same time, um, he is calling for an international development strategy of sovereign nation states, which he outlines in his Cosmopolitan Railway book that he publishes in 1890 Mm -hmm. um, with the link across the Bering Strait, but more so across Africa in Southwest Asia, the Middle East. And he outlines chapters on banking, on how do you fund it, utilizing state banks with a a type of international greenback institution. He goes into some mechanics on this thing. Um, there's some obviously some some um, 19th century racist language that one might find well, reprehensible. That, that, that's the, the you know that's but, the 1800s there, man. That that's just the way things were. So it's like uh, that's the way uh, things were. Mark Twain, you just gotta accept I, it. Exactly, you know. And I, I, cause I always get like some hate mail when people say, "Oh yeah, but he said these 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 racist words," and it's like, "Yeah, but oh. he fought and risked his life he to stop slavery." Like you know he. There, there, look how he lived his life. He obviously doesn't think like Cecil Rhodes. So anyway. Well, um, that's a problem, dude. A lot of times people have a lot of trouble getting like uh, jumping that sort of a uh, mental gap between the present and the past because uh, things were very different back then, especially terminology wise. Like if you think about it, even some of those basic words in our language that seem to exist in the um, uh, expressions more than anything. Uh, like you do you ever really hear anyone like, you know, we use terms like blind, deaf or mute or dumb uh, in their original context. Yeah. Not very rarely anymore. They have all been, they're too blunt. They're too, too few letters. We have to have vision impaired, hearing impaired or uh, speechless or something. Maybe you could say, but anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a side, mm-hmm. a side thing. Addendum. Please don't read the newspaper, Matt. We need you here. We need you. We, no, no, no. We I'm, need looking your I'm looking for a quote. Oh, I'm totally okay. For a quote. Oh, I thought that was I a newspaper. I was like, he's oh, he's got the times out. He's already he's done. <laughs> All right. No, no. I got I got I got I got So here, there, there's a, an important quote here that uh, struck me when I read. Um, well, there's two guys who play a really important role to to destroy this. Yeah. Um, the the roundtable movement is set up uh, according to the the money and 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 
will to follow the, the 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 mission laid out in the will of Cecil Rhodes, the guy who was the, the British imperialist race patriot diamond magnate who basically did a lot of genocide and rape of South Africa and Rhodesia and Zimbabwe, set up De Beers, you know, uh, all this to say he dies, but he leaves a will and with a lot of money overseen by the Cecil family, a certain um, figure within the Rothschild dynasty mm. that becomes known as the the Rhodes Trust. The Rhodes Trust sets up an international network of think tanks under the, what's, what becomes known as the Roundtable Movement with branches in each of the Anglo-Saxon um, nations. And they also have a, a scholarship program called the Rhodes Scholarship to indoctrinate a new breed of uh, imperial manager with a more um, disciplined like kind of like a, a Jesuit styled, as he says in his own, mm -hmm. is in his wills, a, a Jesuit modeled constitution of indoctrination within the halls of Oxford that would create a more trustworthy brand of um, high level civil servant that is better than the t type of old school, you know, more Christian, Anglican Christian mm -hmm. uh, variants we, we were if forced to create. If only he knew that he would create Lloyd Austin much later. Sorry, I forgot well, where it cost to went to college. I just, wanted, a, I just wanted to bust on that guy. Sorry, okay, yo, carry on. Was he a Rhodes Scholar? Uh, no, I, f I forget, but I was just saying that, like, uh, about this, like, uh, when you describe this sort of, like, the indoctrination of the uh, picking people based on loyalty, that's, he's the first person that really came to mind, you know, as, like... Well, like, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. He's definitely a creature of the system, and definitely um, there are so many Rhodes Scholars around Joe Biden managing this guy, like Jake Sullivan, Susan mm -hmm. Rice, um... Uh, oh my God! Um, um, Bruce Reed, yeah. uh, political agent, controller of of Biden, uh, co-authored the uh, the Patriot Act with Biden back in 1994. That was remixed by Ashcroft. Um, there, there's a whole nest of these these creatures. They're everywhere. They and so in in the case of the United States, one of their think tanks becomes known as the Council on Foreign Relations. That's set up in 19, uh, 1921 mm -hmm. as the the American branch of this British hive of Chatham House. This is the British Roundtable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so all that to say, they work to get, they work very closely with another uh, eugenics based um, secret society that m works through the Fabian Society of H. G. Wells. Uh, Halford Mackinder, the, the founder of modern geopolitics, is a big figure in the Fabian Society. Now, Mackinder and Milner, Lord Milner is a key, key leader of um, of the Roundtable movement. Mm -hmm. They work very closely together. Milner and Mackinder both go to Canada in 1909. Oh. And they go to Canada because you, you've, you've got a Lincoln Republican who finds himself as Prime Minister of Canada at, the, at this period called uh, Wilfrid Laurier. Yeah. And Laurier is a devout pro, uh, anti Malthusian, pro development grand strategist. He had formerly been working in a network of Republicans called Les Rouges, the Reds mm -hmm. of Quebec in the 1860s against Confederation and for development. Re like really solid people. And this guy finds himself, I don't even know how, it's a miracle. He, he becomes prime minister. But he's also trying to stay alive because it's a dangerous time to be um, a humanist leader in a in a especially amongst um, a British colony of Canada or Dominion of Canada. Uh, ironically, and stay alive, uh, in you know, 2023 the within the West, uh, that is also true. I'm sure you know firsthand. I'd also like to thank you. You mentioned my favorite yeah. word of all time, Malthusian. Anti Malthusian also counts. So got got our Malthusian yeah, of the that's day. That's really hard to be anti-Malthusian with political power in uh, the technocracy of the West these yeah, days. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, hard. and it's only getting uh, worse. But anyways, uh, we'll uh, we'll pray yeah, for yeah, you, Matt. A... <laughs> we'll continue on our story so, here. Okay, I'll have to take a shot because you said so, Malthusian. I just don't have any alcohol here. <laughs> all right, well, well, we'll we'll take a little note. We'll make a list and. Uh, all right, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep later. score if he comes up again. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so Mackinder is encouraged to uh, quit his job as the director of the London School of Economics in mm -hmm. 1909 when yeah. he meets up with Milner and Milner says, I need your help. Oh. We got to figure out what to do with this Laurier independence problem of Canada because Laurier wants to um, work more closely to revive the, the Isaac Buchanan idea of an American Zol a North American Zolverein. For those mm -hmm. who don't know, go back to the last episode. Yeah. A customs union of North America with a, a, a protectionist tariff around the continent to block uh, British goods from going into Canada. Mm. Now, um, Milner agrees. He accepts the uh, the contract, is paid for by the Rhodes Trust, and he writes in, in a Westminster report in 1911 on his findings, and he says, ultimately, Mackinder to the, to the British Parliament now saying, 
Ultimately, we have to look to the question of power, and power rests upon economic development. If Canada is drawn into the orbit of Washington, then this empire, the British Empire, mm -hmm. loses its great opportunity. The dismemberment of the empire will not be limited to Canada. Australia will avail herself of the power of the American fleet in the Pacific, and she will not long depend on a decaying and breaking empire. Then with the resources of this island, uh, this island country, you will be left to maintain your position in India. That constitutes, in my opinion, the significance of the present crisis. We are turning the tide. Oh, we are at the turning of the tide. He's warning. And he's basically saying, we're going to lose India now, too. If you let if you let this breaking up begin in Canada, yeah. it's going to spread everywhere no, and no. there won't be an empire. We're in an mm -hmm. existential freaked out crisis right now. Um, Milner um, writes to Leo Amory, another leader of the Roundtable Movement, 1909. Describing it very clearly, and again, this is the guy who sets up the, the Canadian, Canadian branch of the Roundtable movement that becomes staffed by generations of Rhodes Scholars and Fabians over the ensuing century. All of our problems, including Christia Freeland, Rhodes Scholar, uh, emanate from this, this hive. It's very important. So what's he going to say? Listen to what he, he's going to mm -hmm. say. As between the three possibilities of the future, number one, closer imperial union, that is the... Um, there's this policy of um, imperial union to create a, a, a integrated uh, global commonwealth of the British Empire under a central command. That was the idea originally of the, uh, the Roundtable movement. And then they shifted gears a little bit to create the League of Nations as a stepping board that would be part of that. So number one, closer imperial union, get Canada more, more ingrained in the union mm -hmm. uh, of Britain. Number two, union with the U.S., and number three, Canadian independence, I believe definitely that number two is the real danger. That is union with the United States, the way Laurier was, was talking, right? Mm -hmm. I do not think the Canadians themselves are aware of it. They are wonderfully immature in political reflection on the big issues and hardly realize how powerful, how powerful the influences are. On the other hand, I see little danger to ultimate imperial unity in Canadian nationalism. On the contrary, I think the very same sentiment makes a great many, especially of the younger Canadians, vigorously and even bumptuously assertive of their independence, proud and boastful of the greatness and future of their country, and so forth, would lend themselves, tactfully handled, to an enthusiastic acceptance of imperial unity based upon, and he quotes it, partner states. Mm. This tendency is therefore, in my opinion, rather to be encouraged not only as safeguard against Americanization, but as actually making in the long run for a union of all of the Britons, the way Cecil Rhodes had outlined. Oh. Now, keep in mind, this sounds for some people kind of like the NAFTA, which was terrible. Mm -hmm. NAFTA is terrible. This is not the same thing because, number one, NAFTA is was done based upon a private corporate banking takeover of the continent. Yeah. After JFK and the nationalists of America, especially Bobby Kennedy, were killed and America was sufficiently reconquered by the the British hand of the city of London mm -hmm. with their Wall Street appendage. And once that was firmly back under the control of the mother country, that's when things like NAFTA were then encouraged as part of a, a consolidation of power across the continent with Mexico and Canada, destroying the manufacturing base, destroying the, the actual capitalist base of, of the oh, america yeah, it was the beginning it was the uh, francis fukuyama the end of history time to burn it all down baby that's exactly what happened yeah, yeah. and uh, the logic was just that get rid of let's let's prepare the groundwork now for what cecil rhodes had in mind recapturing the the belligerent colonies of the americas re-establishing a newly global british empire as a new mm -hmm. global uh roman empire that would not be disturbed by the problem of christianity which edward gibbons resolved was the cause of the first roman empire melting down he says oh that and britain was like yeah yeah same thing right oh those um, pagans so, man they love that but yeah oh they do and that that's always the battle of the idea of what rome was right was it, which part of rome do we want to look at and uh, the empires obviously look the hellfire british empire well, is always looking some at sort of the, like the pagan, a coked pagan out sacrificing. i'll put this if you're a coked huh? out pagan you definitely like the first part where you could just do whatever you want with anyone who you consider weaker than yourself even though you're probably some weirdo yeah. sitting in your mom's basement doing the coke but anyways that's a <laughs> that's a side point that's my personal 
yeah. disgust with a certain type of person. But anyways, okay, so here we are. We are now getting closer to the present. I'm kind of seeing what you're saying. So they're they want yeah. the British essentially want to really kind of draw in America in, in in some way. Yeah. So here's the thing. <clears throat> the Lori liberals get taken out in uh, 1911. Yeah. There's a, a coup d'état run by the, the Masonic uh, Orange Men of, of Ontario. Uh, something like one in every two adult males above the age of 18 in 1911 are Masonic Orange Men from the Masonic Orange Lodges that were set up by William of Orange wow. in Ireland originally. Um, that is, that or, is a very in the Netherlands and then in society. Ireland. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And this has been documented. We have a, a former uh, a collaborator of mine who actually did a thorough documentation of this. Um, and the round table. And then you have Laurier himself after he's ousted from power, right when he's about to consolidate his customs union. Um, you have him writing a couple of years later to Odie Skelton, his uh, foreign minister, saying that a group known as the round table is sitting in London controlling both parties, the Grits and the Tories, a.k.a. liberals and the conservatives, um, with no regard for the Canadian people or nation. And this is now Canada is getting pulled into conscription into World War One as part of a new geopolitical operation to break the world under shock therapy under a war that was designed originally to get russia and germany to slaughter each other yeah it was a chaos operation and undo the danger of the american system of lincoln followers under otto von bismarck that had done so much to bring germany into becoming a real sovereign industrial nation state working in harmony with pro-industrialists of france under seti carnot yeah. of uh Sergei Vita, the finance minister and, of Russia, and, and, and his teaming collaborator. teaming up with Russia, just like the Russian aristocracy thought would happen before World War I. Yep. Yeah. And so that blew up, and the whole thing was, was organized. Even to this very day, no historian has a very good reason satisfying why the hell did World War I happen. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was a completely contrived set of secret military agreements around the Entente Cordiale, which Germany had no way to know about. And it was only at the last minute. Germany was the last nation to militarize itself for the war. Um, a, you know, and it, Sergei Vita had already been ousted a long time earlier after the first attempt at a Bolshevik revolution funded by Wall Street back in 1905 was already like had already happened way mm -hmm. earlier. The same year the, the Trans-Siberian is finalized. But the 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 reforms of, of Vita were not permitted to blossom, even though they set up the Duma. You know, they did all of these things to start liberalizing things and and. It was too little too late. The pressure cooker was on. And uh, and there were a lot of operations from within the Russian Okhrana, the, the Russian secret police. Mm -hmm. um, things like Count Ignatiev, I think, is an important figure because who was the founder of the secret police from the was, you know, it, it was an Ignatiev mm -hmm. uh, who founded the secret police. And his son, Peter Ignatiev, was one of the the only, I think, uh, executive, the cabinet ministers of, of Nicholas II who survives the murder spree of 1917 and is brought into Canada. And his son, George Ignatius, becomes a, a Rhodes Scholar globalist working uh, to push one world government. And his son, George Ignatiev's son, is Michael Ignatiev, who goes on to head the Liberal Party of Canada um, between Bob Ray and uh, Justin Trudeau. Hmm. Um, so you have this whole weird, and, and they're very connected to George Soros in, after the 1970s too, which is weird. So you got this whole internal operation within the Okhrana, which is tied to certain very bad interests that are working with their oligarchical um, collaborators in Venice, in Italy, in in Britain, uh, to basically just like like break the break the chessboard. You know, when you can't win the game, you you knock everything over. And it's the age of assassinations between Lincoln all the way to Archduke Ferdinand. There's like 40 yeah. major high level assassinations nations around the world including two czar three czars um well two czars and then a third soon thereafter um you have finance ministers galore interior ministers of russia germany has, has gets something like 300 of its ministers killed by by london protected and directed anarchist terrorist operations that have mm -hmm. different facets in serbia with the black hand that's used to deploy to kill a disposable archduke that then initiates a whole series of mili military agreements between yeah. Austria and Germany and Serbia and Russia and, and everything else jumps on, right? So it's a five-year meat grinder, four-year meat grinder, out of which the, the, the roundtable movement under Lord Milner has now fully taken control of Britain to set the stage and, and shape the, the outcome of the, um, the piece of the Treaty of Versailles period in 1819 which then creates the basis of a lot of other things. The one world, the first one world government under British 
Bank of England controls was the League of Nations yeah. to get rid of national sovereignty. Fortunately, you have in America the case of the Warren Harding Republicans, the last Lincoln Republicans who take power. They resist. They uh, That fails. And the Laurier liberals again take power after Laurier dies. All of his colleagues then take power after World War II in Canada, World War I in Canada, and uh, start p bringing back a nationalist policy of development for Canada. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot that I'm going to skip over, but I'm going to go to the second part of the story. And if people want to read more, they should go to The Clash of the Two Americas and Untold History of Canada, Volumes 1 to 4. Each one is a four-volume book series. The lot, a lot is going to be unpacked in those books. But I'll say the, the last time that there's Did a real effort them? to... Yes. Okay, that's an important point you should make, dude, because you're one of the most uh, established authors I've ever met. Here the, yeah, here are, here are the books. Uh, so they're all pretty big. Um, they're like hefty books. Yeah. And um, this one is the, uh, the... The first one is the Unfinished Symphony mm -hmm. from 1774 to 1891. The second one is uh, Open Systems versus Closed Systems Collide between... 1890, uh, 1891 to 1974. Mm -hmm. The third one is Birth of a Eurasian Manifest Destiny with picture Ben Franklin in the uh, the Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. there. All right. And then the fourth one is the Anglo-Venetian Roots of the Deep State. And what I'm going to say now yeah. is I'll unpack in a lot of this, but I'm going to skip over some stuff and just go to the next high point in U.S.-Russian friendship because we just passed... I mean, today is Elba Day. I don't know when you're going to run this thing, but today is Elba Day. Yeah, I, I probably tomorrow. But yeah, today is a, the height of U.S., uh, Soviet, or Russian friendship, officially. Unfortunately, I missed the conference. Yes. You invited me to about that earlier. <laughs> Sorry, man. I kind of got stuck with the whole parenting thing. <laughs> Not us. It's totally good. You're you're yeah. living your life for the cause, man. It's fine. Well, an an event is, kids, is an yeah. event. So. <laughs> um, so here's a, it's a good point to just emphasize this Elba Day was the embrace of U.S. and Russian soldiers on the Elba River in Germany on April yeah. 15th. Sorry. 25th. April 25th. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Weird little brain fart. Um, <clears throat> that signaled the, the defeat of the danger of a Nazi-run one-world government under a banker's dictatorship. So it's, it's, it means more than a lot of people realize it means. And that dream that Franklin Roosevelt had, that Stalin had, that, uh, that Henry Wallace had the, the vice president of, of Franklin Roosevelt of a world shaped by a U.S. Russia China alliance that would force Britain into a uh, like like a dog on a leash into a better form of behavior. Yeah, that world was sabotaged, but it was a high point of, of hope and potential. Mm -hmm. And part of that potential was marked by discussions by Foreign Minister of Russia Molotov mm -hmm. and uh, Vice President Henry Wallace, who had begun in 1942. And I cite their quotes and their their deliberations around reviving this Lincoln Age uh, program of connecting roads and rail through the Arctic, mm -hmm. through Alaska and into Russia vis-a-vis -vis the Bering Strait. Um, they they both said very clearly that it was only not a matter of if but when it was going to happen. And that was going to be one of the first projects for Arctic development to open the new frontier that was mm -hmm. going to drive the reconstruction of the world after World War II was completed. Unfortunately, um, some other things got in the way, Na namely the, the early death, untimely so, of oh, FDR. Who like Warren Harding. Like, he's a man named Truman. I was yeah, and then say. Truman is involved. Truman, Truman yeah. was, was a big barrier. He really, uh, he changed, he, he moved the Overton window in Washington very quickly. Yes, he did. And he, he ushered in the uh, what's called the Anglo-American Special Relationship. Uh, he passed uh, certain bills through executive decree that put American foreign policy into the um, into the service of the British Foreign Office by saying by essentially twisting this logic under NSC 68 that mm -hmm. since the Cold War, which, you know, all of a sudden Russia, who we, we were we were brothers with brothers in arms for 150 years all of a sudden, we're going to call them our enemy. Since they're our enemy, and so is China, all of a sudden, says Churchill, and, and adopted by all of the deep state Rhodes Scholar run operatives like Dean Rusk and mm -hmm. uh, George McGee, other, another Rhodes Scholar who's shaping U.S. Uh, Cold War policy. Um, since that's the case, all of the former territories of Great Britain that want independence are tending to move socialists, and they are moving out of our sphere of influence. So we can't allow that for the greater good. 
And so all of a sudden, the U.S. military goes into the service of British foreign interests to keep the colonies under the control of the West, Mm -hmm. starting with Greece, where the U.S. military is deployed to kill a ton of Greek Republican resistance fighters who uh, are are pro-Russian in a democratic election. That, that's smashed. And then the U.S. military is put to work in Korea, in yeah. Vietnam, and all over the world doing everything we know. And Canada, unfortunately, you know, uh, falls increasingly, despite the fact that you still have some positive influences in Ottawa at the time who are anti-British empire, they're still now in a world of insanity. They need, just like the Ameri- the Canadian rebellion of 18, 1837-38 that we were talking mm-hmm. about last podcast, they needed an America that was sane to work with in order to fully consummate their independence of Canada in the 1940s and 50s, which yeah. the U.S. went crazy. There was no nationalist leader when it counted. And uh, when there was a, a, a sort of res- restoration of, of an authentic nationalism in the form of John F. Kennedy, that was s- snuffed out a little bit too soon. There's stories about that as well in the Canadian allies of JFK in British Columbia in the 1960s that are worth also reading about, too, in my book series, The Untold History of Canada, which mm. is not here. I don't have those books right now. Um, so all that series. to say, Canada... Yeah, dude, you're writing a lot. But all here's right. the last thing I'll say. Canada, if you want to understand why JFK was killed and how he was killed, you can't get far without rec- without acknowledging the work of New Orleans... Uh, Attorney General Jim Garrison, who wrote, who wrote a book called Trail of the Assassins in 1990, after 30 years of ongoing work. And this is the only guy who ever carried out a, a jury trial over the conspiracy to kill Ken, uh, Kennedy, mm-hmm. tied to, and, and Garrison does pretty well to prove it, a twofold operation utilizing NATO secret armies of Gladio and specifically some French uh, um, um, organization of the secret armies. Um, that kill that tries to kill the gull, yeah. um, that are operational in in Texas in New Orleans, as well as a Montreal based operation that's tied to the CIA called Permindex, which was originally set up as a front group out of Camp X, which was a FBI CIA connected operation in Oshawa, Canada, during World War II to train um, black operations and assassinations for specialized um, spies that then goes on to create a a front group to carry out other assassinations on the form of permanent industrial exposition run by Mortimer Bloomfield. Louis Mortimer Bloomfield is a former OSS operative um, who's part of the Sir William Stevenson network of pathetic, uh, orgy-loving spies who's overseeing the murder of Kennedy from Montreal after his uh, his his French branch is kicked out of France by Charles de Gaulle's intelligence agencies when they discover permanent permindex to be behind at least two of the 30 assassination attempts against the Gaulle. So again, Montreal is still playing the same role it played when it killed when mm-hmm. Lincoln's murderers were deployed to kill Lincoln from Canada, utilizing Confederate Montreal based and Toronto based and Kingston based uh, Confederate intelligence uh, operations up here. Same thing back a century later. And I would say probably it's not gotten better today in that sense. So people should be aware of that. And I would say the last thing, when Donald Trump last, the last time that I saw or the most recent time that the idea of building up the Arctic in North America really got some life was when Donald Trump was still president and he passed an executive decree uh, supporting the building of the Alaska, Canada, lower 48 state rail connection which had the support Mm. of the provincial governor of Alberta, probably the only independence mind uh, province that has the economic power to sort of resist some of the edicts of of Mm. Ottawa and uh, and endorse that, which would have finally connected the thousand kilometers of nothing between the lower rail systems in the lower part of the continent with um, Alaska, that there's just nothing there at all in northern Alberta, B.C. or the Yukon. nothing, And then that would have brought another... um, discussion in a more healthy way to the Eurasian development structures of rail and maritime shipping and industrial growth of Eurasia, which is currently the only thing that has a future to it in the world right now. So that would have been uh, something much more healing and natural for North America to re- recapture its best lost heritage, which was derailed with what we know what happened in the United States, which hopefully can be restored in a discussion with the um, potential merger of the better Americans under perhaps 
Bobby Kennedy Jr. and the better MAGA Republicans who don't want to go well, yeah, to World something War III. This, this Kennedy Jr. and uh, the stuff he's saying publicly, something about that really smells like it's some kind of weird signal. That's just yeah, weird. So? It is think? weird wait, that wait, he's, coming thoughts, out, thoughts, he's, he's coming out there and he is, it's almost like he's like, okay, I'm going to take the Donald Trump shtick and I'm going to read off the card, but I'm going to read it the way I would normally read it. It is very bizarre. Um, this, to be honest, uh, Matt, I, I think maybe on a different day we could uh, get into this, but it's my, uh, this is a feeling and feelings sometimes lie. I almost kind of feel like over the last few years, maybe five or so, the United States is almost in a like black, uh, as in secretive, not as in African, uh, like a black civil war between like within itself between these different factions because sometimes you have like you're of your hunter uh, hunter biden laptop being exposed but then he's not in trouble now he's gonna be in trouble then he's not or with trump gets accused of one thing and gets sort of put up to be destroyed then he isn't and then he gets put up again and then he isn't there's this like ebb and flow of moving pieces and uh when you also get into the whole thing about like how much uh american uh, especially food infrastructure and this uh m- like the uh, I have a friend. We share each other uh, with each other as as a dark humor, uh, sort of these uh, different, um, like you know, when trains derail. Dude, there have been like twelve derailments this year, and they're starting to become evidence where they actually caught. Uh, they left behind. There's apparently something that can help a train for whatever reason specifically get off the tracks. It's like this yellow box with a handle. That there was one still there. Um, this is something bizarre is happening. I think b- behind the scenes that maybe. We oh, there is. Try to no, break th- down. there is. There's totally the above grounders inside of the institutions of Davos, as well as the the, the deep state of America, yeah. um, working to create scarcity and undermine whatever is viable of energy and food oh, production capabilities, yeah. as well as the below grounders who have been nurtured as these neo eco anarchist terrorists, like we had in, in the London anarchist movement, which was always protected yeah. by London, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That was carrying out the assassinations of troublesome leaders in the 1870s, 80s, 90s um, into Archduke Ferdinand. The, the, the international terrorism is not a, a naturally, organically evolving sociological phenomenon the way that we've been taught. Neither is like, no. you know, Muslim well, yeah, terrorism as well. The thing is, that is it's what you, the key thing is what you said is the way we've been taught. Because, again, this is yeah. one of these things where I, I try to tell people that the most basic thing is someone is, a, is an activist. That means they get a salary. Who pays it? Someone is a terrorist. Where did the bullets come from? Where did lunch come from? Everyone who does something yep. professionally, the money has to come from somewhere. And that really, once you start realizing that, you sort of see that activists and terrorists and all these others, they're all actors in someone's interests. Always. Because they can't be otherwise, or they're also just weird people like me who sit behind a computer and make weird podcasts, ineffectively. <laughs> Dude, no, I, I, I've written something pretty thorough on this. I, I sent it to Whitney, uh, and I, I'm hoping she picks it up and runs it. It's it's a thorough deep dive into the eco-terrorist networks that have been cultivated by Anglo-American intelligence that are pro- that are actually bragging about the 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 sabotage of vital infrastructure rail energy and other um on their own official website they actually have a list of several hundred different attacks and how it was done to normalize the attack the the necessary war that has to be waged against industrial civilization to save gaia yeah yeah, yeah. They, it, it's it's all available on their website i got screenshots oh, their, their targets go to, are very selective that's one yeah. thing the russian media really exposed them uh i might be wrong on this uh i wish i could do like a little google search but it'll kill the program I think Greenpeace is actually banned in Russia because it's considered a slightly terrorist organization. I think it is. That would be a, that would be a smart move. I know that there was a uh, lot of complaints that that Greenpeace had against Russia. Um, I would that would be a really brilliant move if Russia did that. Yeah. I hope they did. Well, their their enforcement okay. of stuff here is very selective. Uh, I'll put it that way. But anyways, Matt, we have very little time. You've got to get going, and it looks up to be about 15 minutes. So again, we're getting almost to the modern times, and now we're starting to see the picture of how Canada is kind of acting like this this wedge or almost jumping off point. In some ways, it's almost kind of like uh, like uh, uh, like like a, a North American Kosovo. Uh, it's just you know uh, this breeding ground for trouble that's sort of just outside the lines. Um, so now mm-hmm. in this, let's bring things from, we kind of talked about the cold war a little bit. That's obvious. What about now? 
How is how is Canada now getting in the way of things? Like we had uh, the uh, attempted rapprochement of the Trump period. Did Canada play some sort of role against this movement by Trump? Well, I think that there were things set up uh, to prepare the groundwork for disruptions of Trump via Canada. I'm sure things did happen that I, I it's difficult. Sometimes it's easier to look back on deep history mm-hmm. and piece things together in hindsight, whereas the present um, things are still sort of hidden behind layers of subterfuge, which, which and the maybe parts future are still kind of moving as we speak. Yeah, um, there's definitely um, probably the greatest stranglehold of of Milner, Milner's um, wet dream fantasy of uh, a mythologized Canada as a branch of the British Empire on the great mm-hmm. game as, as sort of a, a pawn in terms of the uh, the ideological commitments of those hampering about in, in Ottawa to impose a depopulation agenda um, coming at us from Davos and not representing the interests of the people. That's out of max. But at the same measure, it's, it's, it's so ugly and... Um, hard to ignore the undemocratic tyrannical nature of what really is is has been there the whole time mm-hmm. it's not like uh, some canadians are still confused you know who came out to the, the truckers freedom convoy in in large numbers millions yeah. um all across canada some of them were like how did canada get this way we were once <laughs> a democratic country not that canadians sound like that and now it's a tyranny and it's like no it's yeah. always been that it's just that things were stable so there was no need to actually just show you what it always was and now that things are unstable mm-hmm. and there's more of an obvious intention to go from theory into action yeah you can now feel it more and see it a little bit more if your eyes are halfway open and and luckily a lot of people's eyes were open so you're seeing a lot of disruptions and unexpected variables now emerging where people are kind of like waking up out of their drunken stupor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like Alberta is going renegade, like the whole province of, of Alberta, which in my mind, I'm not for division and separation or secession in general, but again, mandate of heaven, the mandate of heaven shapes the context of when something could be good or bad, depending on what's the context. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Joining the U S under NAFTA bad joining the U S under Lincoln. That would be okay. Why yeah, yeah. moral mandate of heaven. Same thing for, Alberta going renegade, and if they want to take the power economically and actually set up something better constitutionally, mm-hmm. premised around natural law, well, good you, on dude, them. And, and it seems like you, you could see that in Russia because if you talk to people across Russia, the various different like my ethnic minorities and all that, what are hmm. their gripes? They all come from one particular period in Russian history the first half of the Soviet Union, as in the revolution and the counter-revolution. That's when everyone is bitter. That's where any hatred for Russians comes from. It's not from before, and it's not from after. Because as soon as the Soviet mm-hmm. Union dies, then Russia goes, okay, you guys remain a part of us, but you get to keep you know, keep your language, pay taxes. You have to learn Russian as a second language in school, but you can have your main language as your main language. You get to keep your religion. And all of a sudden, everyone is able to get along without that revolutionary yoke uh, that does did all sorts of uh, uh dude i've heard it from the locals because i travel around a lot i've heard it from chechens i've heard it from eskimos so we're going from like all the way from one from cossacks so literally from all, all the way from the one end of russia all the way to the other all these different minorities and different groups everyone suffered because of the russian russian revolution uh, that's one thing who has when you're you're like 18 or 19 communism seems cool but after you talk to people and like the history of this it was the worst man it, it was, was so all... bad it didn't have to uh man i i the more i look into it too you know i, I started by reading anthony p sutton's uh wall street and the bolshevik revolution which was a big eye-opener for me yeah um and it demonstrated that it had a lot of elements of a proto-color revolution to it um managed because the, you know the, russia was on the verge of evolving into something great envisioned by Mendeleev, Vernadsky, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vitin, and other patriots. And that had to be stopped because it was tied to the development of China at the time, which was going through their own Lincoln style, Lincoln modeled revolution uh, in 1910 under Sun Yat-sen, who had a, his own grand vision for a pro-US Russia-China alliance of development and big infrastructure and science. Mm-hmm. All anti-Malthusian uh, people, very consciously so. Malthusian. Um, more, more shots for tonight. Yeah, two shots. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry um, word of the day so, every no, day in my life like Anyways, yes. chemistry. but yeah, yeah dude because um uh, one thing i can't tell yeah. you is uh we'll, we'll end this on a positive note 
Uh, there's some uh, secret rumblings from within the halls of power that they want to have, uh, you know, there's 150 million people in Russia now, and the government would really like to see in the near future, somehow there'll be 500 million people. So I think we're in, we're going to be heading towards some big social changes in the way we do everything here. I think the special military operation sort of started things, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Hopefully, That's good. No, Russia needs 500 million people. Russia needs a billion people. That's a huge territory, yeah. and that means you got to build a real economy that's super like you can do it i mean russia russia if anybody's going to do it in this world it's going to be china and russia yeah. and, it's and they're going to set the tape set the tempo talking- and 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 be the role model for other people to realize like well why am i eating bugs yeah. and, and taking my suicide pill when i'm 50 when you know the russians get to live till they're 108 and they're eating like you know red meat yeah. and, uh, and that's exactly a good life. russia's destiny right now it's sort of like it's gone back in time to that pre-world war one status where it's kind of back on the track to be on that sort of path to glory. And dude, what you're saying about the whole, like uh, the, the, the death pill and the bugs, that's the reality of things here, man. Like, yeah, there are some globalists here, but if you were to, to live here and see year by year, they lose more and more and more and more. And I'm sure some, uh, uh, particularly lovely Dick is going to write in the comments. Well, the guy who was responsible for a lot of the COVID measures, uh, he's still not in jail. We'll see. <laughs> I think some of the stuff is only a matter of time. But anyways, Matt Eret has just proven that Canada has been this invisible wedge between the United States and Russia. Thank you very much, man. And where can people buy your books, uh, both mm-hmm. maybe in the West and over here? <laughs> How can people find your books? Right. So if you live on this side of the Iron Curtain, yeah. it's very easy. Well, it, the easiest way would be to go to CanadianPatriot.org, and uh, you could see very easily little signs that say, buy my book, buy my book. So you just yeah. click on one of those. My wife also just produced a really fabulous book on the empire in which the black sun never set, going through a, a deeper dive than I've ever seen anyone do into the uh, the roots of fascism going into the 19th century, mm-hmm. and it uh, it's wild. Um, so oh, that, yeah. that's also going to be very easy to find. And, if you uh, are in be Russia, dr- I think there's going to be some drugs and orgies in that one too, right? <laughs> that's going to be volume two. Oh, the volume first two. one's okay. more in the, okay. the political mechanics of it all, oh, and then the volume two gets into the the Blavatsky weird. Occult. Oh my gosh! Oh, dude, if she's gonna, willing she's to come on there. here, and if she's could because, dude, Yelena Blavatskaya is the most famous Russian person most people have never heard about. Oh really? my God! Uh, she, she she is slowly equipping herself. She she needs to get a few more resources in her in her tool chest before she goes to battle. But she wants to be really equipped. All right, whatever. So I, I whenever she's, whenever she's ready to get in the ring, we're gonna have a Yelena Blavatskaya like uh, fest. I'm sorry if we talk for two hours, That's it might cool. be a full no, I'm, hour. I'm, I'm, dude, she is so I'm super influential. Excited today. She's actually really, eh? okay. possibly the most influential woman who ever lived. Maybe I might take that back later, but I think it's possible that I, I could put like a. A five thousand rule bet Amazing. on that and win it. So, oh but. man, yeah, we got we have we've got some books that we purchased on uh, the history of the occult in Russia with a lot of Blavatsky's writings and and yeah, I, I'm sure she's going to piece together something, but it won't be too soon. Okay. I would say if you do we'll, want to we'll, we'll get her on, she'll, she'll, <laughs> yeah, she'll definitely we'll actually talk about her. Uh, this is what her book looks like right now: oh. the uh, birth of international fascism and Anglo-American foreign policy, going through the roundtable networks behind. Um, Hitler, the growth of Nazism, Italian fascism, the pan-European fascist mm-hmm. movements of Count Kalergi mm-hmm. and the other Venetian uh, inbred oligarchs pushing a new world order back in the <laughs> early 20s even. Yeah. So she'll definitely talk about any of that stuff. It also gets into some nasty uh-huh. stuff of um, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, political Zionism, like Jabotinsky, okay. the whole thing. Well, that, that so could, again, that's hold that. Us up for, hold us over for a little bit. All right, well, Matt, you'll that's talk to your wife real soon. Yeah. She's probably in yeah. the other room. Last so thing, easy. Russia, 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 Russia. Russia, yes, uh, so Russia if books, yes. If you're Russian and you want to re- let's read the Russian um, edition of The Clash of the Two Americas, yeah, which is now available in the Russian market, write me an email because I forget the name of the website, but send me an email to... Canadian Patriot 1776 at tutanota.com. And well, the, with the that, I will give you the Dean, information. Right? Dean, Dean. Yeah, it's, it was Gen TV and uh, Nasha Zaftra is, I think, the publishing house. Oh, but Nasha Gen Z- TV is. Oh, uh, okay. I, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's yeah. going to require. So, anyway, work. send me an email. I'll send you the links to, to order it in Russia. Well, the main Russian, thing is in Russian, do they call you Eret or Ech Ret? I think the first one. The first one. Oh, see, on my phone, I like with ich, 
So that's how you're saved on my phone. Well, anyways, I think they, they, they might be modifying it for my my English ear uh, to to make it easy on me. But you, I don't I don't know what the right is that the right way with the. Well, hech? yeah. Well, because if we could uh, see the thing is if we keep the H, then it becomes echriat. Yeah, yeah. What, which I personally like better. It's more brutal. It's more heavy yeah. metal. Like you mentioned, because uh, that uh, organization, Akhrana, that's the same thing. <sighs> Akhrana. Akhrana. Yeah. Oh, there I didn't go. know that. All right. But All right. I'll introduce myself as Echet from, yeah. uh, from now on. It is kind of uh, cool. All right. But anyways, dude, we're going to hit it. Thank you very much for being with us, guys. This was, uh, again, Matt, every time we talk, eye-opening. Eye-opening, guys. So anyways... <laughs> Uh, stay tuned. Yelena Blavatskaya coming soon.